Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, coming to you from Blade Show Atlanta 2024. And uh, as every year, it's been exciting, awesome, fun. Uh, not only seeing all the great new knives coming out and uh, all the all the great products in the two big rooms over there at Blade Show, well, big room and then the baller room, which is smaller, but it's really great to meet everyone. Uh, again, it's been a year that I've seen these people and it's fun to meet up with the knife makers that I've interviewed over the past year. And of course, uh, meet all of you. Uh, I've had several people come up and introduce themselves and I love that. Um, so it's been great. This is the last day here at Blade Show. Uh, after we record here, I'm gonna go over and see if there's anything else, maybe something going on sale, maybe someone wants to get rid of something before they travel. I'm gonna be that guy there, just waiting to snap it up. Um, well, I came here to Blade Show with very few knives because I don't like to travel, I don't like to tempt TSA uh, to become a knife junkie in that way. So I didn't bring too many knives, but I brought a couple of special ones. So right now, before we get into the interviews here and before we get into any of the stuff I've gotten, let us now get to a pocket check. Okay, so I'm calling this my pre-purchase pocket check. Uh, so I came here with this folder. Uh, this is the uh, Civivi Synergy 4, nice, big, beautiful, uh, Tonto made by Civivi. You've seen me show this off before. Uh, my strategy is always to travel to Blade Show with a folding knife that I could easily replace if it were lost. And the past few years, I've brought a Kubi Flash. This year, I decided to change it up and brought the uh, Civivi. And I'm glad I did. I was looking at the Civivi booth. I did not see one of these there. Um, but today, I will. I'll go back over and uh, and see what they have because. Um, well, Civivi's, uh, th those are my wife's favorite knives, and she recently lost uh, uh, Cinesis, so that's a send cut, and so I got to see if I can replace that. Uh, but this has been in my pocket, hasn't been uh, touched because of what else I had, and this got touched a lot. That sounds funny, <laughs> but I was carrying the, uh, the Agent 001, which debuted here at Blade Show 2024 at the TKL Knives uh, booth. And TKL Knives just crushing it, killing it. Uh, they've been on the rise for four years now. And um, not to brag, but I'm going to do it. Uh, this has been their biggest knife release so far. So uh, the knife came out to uh, great fanfare. And people have been snap snapping it up. So uh, they made 400 of them. They're almost all sold. Uh, so it's a great honor to be a part of uh, the TKL Knives operation in this in this regard, and uh, hopefully we'll be doing some other knives together in the future. I think we probably will. Um, but I would pull this out. I've been pulling this out all weekend and showing it to people because that's what you do at Blade Show. You show off knives to one another. And oh, hey, did you see my collaboration with TKL Knives and inside I'm like, check this out. Uh, so a lot of great response on the uh, on the Agent 001. The other knife I had, I know you, I know you know what this is going to be. Uh, also in my waistband, the Nova 2. Um, so this goes, this is going to be, uh, this is a post Blade Show release. I had a chance to hang out with uh, with Matt Chase of Hogtooth Knives quite a bit. And uh, we were talking about this we're in, and figuring out there are no changes to this knife. There are a few changes to the sheath. Um, and we were talking about that. And uh, Jim, I know, has been working on the on the purchase page, working on it, it's done. So uh, we're gonna be rolling this out. But this is another one I kept pulling out and showing. I feel like a Yenta, you know, uh, one of those uh, uh, matchmakers who who um, who gets people together for marriage. But for me, uh, I've, I've been having fun introducing knife lovers to knife makers and knife makers to other knife makers and that kind of thing. Um, I just find great pleasure in it. So I'd be at the... Uh, Hogtooth Knives booth and, oh, check out what he's making for me and pull this out and show it off. Not only to get people interested in this knife, but to show off the width and breadth of Matt Chase's talent. And uh, I like doing that with, I like doing that um, because 
These are the people who are making the things we love. And I think that we should give them as much support, um, not only monetarily, but uh, spiritually as possible. Um, so <clears throat> that's what we got there. And, uh, oh, uh, Jim brings up an interesting point. Thursday Night Knives on the 20th, we're giving away the Eutectic uh, Trinity, a clip point flipper from Liang Ma. And uh, I had a chance to see him too. And he's got some cool stuff uh, on his table and some cool stuff coming up. Uh, I got to say, just having those Eutectics has has whetted my appetite for more Liang Ma uh, knives. Really like those designs. All right, uh, I think it's time to, to show off some of the stuff I got. Now, this is just a mere tease, okay? I'm gonna show you just, just what I got. I'm not gonna talk much about them because on um, the Wednesday supplemental, I'll have a chance to put them under the knife cam, get up close with them and talk. But uh, I just wanna show you briefly what I got here before we get to these fantastic interviews that I recorded on the floor. It is a little loud, uh, but that's the nature of the beast. You know, people are there, they're excited. Uh, so first, state of the collection. Now I was mentioning this first item, I was mentioning I was gonna go to first, gonna go to their table first and see if they had it, uh, and it's not a knife. It is the Spooky Pockets Brass Knuckles. Uh, Spooky Pockets, a uh, brother of um, John Balatsis, uh of, Copus Designs, and uh, he's doing all of these um, knuckle dusters and, and interesting kind of uh, things like this. The reason I was looking for this one is because this is the same uh, model that I have the 3D print of, and it fits my hands so well, and it, it punches so well with a full, full fist, as opposed to an opened up fist that you have to do on some brass knuckles. Uh, that I had to get it. So I ran over there and got these. They are awesome. And it's cool to have them in brass, the classic material. They are heavy, but I've been walking around with them in my pocket um, all weekend. Maybe that's not the wisest idea. I don't think they're the most legal things <laughs> that you can carry around, uh, but I love them. So uh, I got the Spooky Pockets of Brass Knuckles. Now, this is something that it's kind of um, in the same line. It's not a knife but it's knife adjacent and it's a self-defense item. And uh, here, let me, let me go, let me write down what I was going to, with my, oh, it's not a purple Sharpie. It's a purple Sharpie with a G10 tip. This is a Revenant Core, let me go this way, Revenant Core Sharpie. So this tip here is not felt and it's not loaded with uh, permanent ink. It is a piece of G10 that is sharpened so that you can stab stuff with it. So uh, this is a great, great little implement uh, to have on you. It's very low profile. It's kind of like having a ventilator pen, you know, taking a Bic and, and, and making it more like a syringe. And this is kind of that kind of thing. And while I was buying it from the, the fella over there at Revenant Corps who does a lot of really cool G10 knives and uh, NPE, non-permissive environment weapons, uh, I was trying to pick out which one should I get, black, red, yep. And he's got, get one that you don't normally use. If you're someone who normally uses Sharpies, which I am, don't get a black one or don't get whatever color you ordinarily use. So I was like, that's a good good call. I will never look at this and think, mm, hopefully I never look at this and think, oh, I got to write with this. I'll know, bang. And plus there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance that comes with a lavender pen that turns into a weapon. All right, next up, I went over to the Rosecraft booth to introduce myself to Andy Armstrong. So I'm dying to get him on the show. And I did, and he's a great guy and uh, he is gonna come on the show. Uh, but as I was leaving, he was like, here, take this. And he gave me a brand new model here. And I will give you the details of it in the Wednesday supplemental. Uh, but I believe this was designed by the owner's son, um, the, the guy that, Andy Armstrong started the company with his son. Um, it's a great front flipper and button lock. And it's called the Easton, two N's, Easton. <laughs> a handsome knife, I like, the, uh, I like that clip and uh, a saber grind. So nice contour G10 scales, nice action. This is my first Rosecraft knives modern knife, uh, modern flipper, I, or modern folder. I have I have a number of the uh, slip joints, as you know, 
but it's nice to have this in hand. Seems like a great knife, and I've used it to eat with so far, so it cuts sausage as well. All right, next up, uh, I spent a lot of time looking for something for both my daughters and my wife. And for my daughters, I decided to get them the same thing, um, just different colors. Even though they're, they differ in age by four years, um, I, I kind of had to keep the monetary um, commitment the same. I don't know if you're, if you're a parent, you might know that, that instinct. But I got them these little Cobra Tech out the front daggers. Got one in purple and one in blue. And my youngest daughter, my younger daughter said, uh, before I left, please get me a dagger. And I'm like, oh man, okay, I'll find you a dagger. Because, uh, you know, both of my girls love daggers for some reason, the double edged thing, maybe, I don't know, or maybe it's just the shape. Uh, but um, I knew that any, any nice dagger is gonna cost me too much uh, and I'm not gonna give them a super expensive dagger or anything like that. And um, I didn't want to get them just a cold steel or, or some something just to get them a dagger. So when I saw this, I figured the, the purple anodization and the action, it's a dagger, it's small, and that action would be something that they would like. So for the daughters, Cobra Tech, and I got to say, I, I was the Cobra Tech switchblades and automatics are pretty, pretty nice. Um, a lot of them are not my taste in terms of how they're, um, how they look and stuff, but uh, the action seems really, really great. And they have a knife coming out. I'm not sure if I can. Well, they have a knife coming out from a very, very famous old school designer. And uh, if you watch this show, you know, I've tried to get this guy on and he almost said yes. And then said, I'm too old for this. Uh, but I had a chance to meet him in. Uh, and I'll tell you who that is next show at, uh, at Blade. And it was a real honor to talk to him. Uh, so. Keep your eyes on Cobra Tech. Next up for my wife, uh, she likes little knives when she goes running. And she's had a Bastinelli diagnostic for a long time for that purpose. But it's D2 and when it's in, gripped in her hand, uh, just it, she sweats and it rusts. And every time she comes back from a run, I'm de-rusting it. So uh, I got her this from Auxiliary Manufacturing. It fits in the sheath, I just didn't put it all the way in. Uh, this is the Broadhead by Auxiliary Manufacturing. Michael Jarvis and his lovely wife, I talked to them for quite a while uh, at their booth. They're so cool, great people, making really awesome knives. Um, and this is, as you can see here, a chisel ground, um, little chisel ground punch dagger. So she can hold this in her hand. She could even hold it like this with a cord. I mean, I guess if she felt really endangered, with the cord on the other end and she can just pull it and have it ready ready to go but otherwise she can have it gripped in her hand or hanging around her neck on the on the ball chain i'm not putting that all the way in because i gotta i gotta work on the sheath it's a very <laughs> if it goes in there a little too stout so i gotta heat it up a little bit and, and uh, loosen it so she can draw it easy, easier but that's how it goes uh, when it's in there really nice uh i think that's fordite um you know that stuff made from paint that is uh, scraped up off the floor in the in the uh, factories. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that material is. I'll ask Michael and I'll tell you on Wednesday. Next up, someone that you've seen here on this show many times, uh, American Blade Works. I went by American Blade Works and he was selling these amazing little slip joints uh, that he just started making. I say he, I mean, uh, Michael Martin and it's got sort of the same texturing as the uh, model number two. And it's got this great one cliff, almost cleaver style blade here, or sheep's foot. I don't know what, what you call that. <laughs> sheep's cleaver. And nice action. And these were only 150 bucks. And I, you know, 150 bucks is not a, a small amount of money, but for a handmade, uh, hand and machine made, homemade, titanium and magna cut um, slip joint of this quality made in the United States, 150 bucks is shockingly cheap and he's or shockingly inexpensive. And he sold all of them. Uh, he brought a bunch of them, sold them all. Uh, and I got, uh, I think one of the last three. So I made it just in time. All right, next up, another guy who's been on the show, Brent Smith of Baldman Knife and Tool. I was by his, uh, 
place uh, by his booth and we were chit chatting and he and he gave me these two to check out and i know that one of them i'm gonna buy i already know which one um but he, he was like no, no 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 just take them and um so I'm, I'm i'm gonna take them and i'm going to buy this one this is a pretty cool uh this is his thicker clipper sorry jim i went to the thicker clipper first it's a tanto it's a quarter inch thick and it's in his most popular line the clipper line and uh, so this is a thicker clipper tanto i love that extreme american tanto that is a, an incredible uh chisel uh working uh, working uh edge there and uh, this is in magna cut also and it's capable of doing a lot uh, i was talking to a guy at his booth <clears throat> excuse me at his booth who uses this in construction and uh, uses it to pound and chisel and open and pry and all sorts of stuff so i uh, love this knife uh, i will probably make that one mine and then we're going to give one away which is very generous of him and i think that will be this thicker tross so he does the albatross which is that that same profile but this one is in quarter inch uh, so he calls it the thicker tross it feels really good in hand um, it's got that great jimping on top and just it's got a nice thick melt in the hand handle and if i'm not mistaken this is that g10 uh, with alternating layers of thin rubber like I have on my Nova one, my Nova, my personal Nova one. Uh, really great material. It's not it's not uh, sticky or tacky like rubber, but you can just feel a little bit. It just adds to the grip just a little bit. And uh, that blade is wicked sharp and nice and thick. Uh, this is these are great great work knives and uh, nice to look at. Okay, second to last here. This one uh, when this came out, I was so excited about it and. But I was like, I'm just not in that mode right now where I'm where I'm spending a lot on folders. And and we all have a different idea of what a lot is. And for me, anything over $200 is a lot on a folder. Um, and I realize I'm dating myself at this point. But um, when this knife came out with Alan Olishowitz and Les George collaborating, uh, I was like, I got to get one of those. And I didn't. And then when I saw this in front of me at the show, I had to get it. Oh, God, I love this. Okay, so this is their Eck Integral. Uh, Eck, John Eck was a knife maker. Um, I believe he started in during World War II, but I could be, could be Vietnam. I, I'm sorry, I got to do the research, but uh, he made knives for commandos and uh, um, they're very famous, the Eck knives. And now um, K-Bar has, uh, has bought up the rights to that, to those, and they're making the fixed blade um, Eck knives. And then here we have Alan Olishowitz and Les George, two amazing makers. Les George is a, is a dagger fanatic and Olishowitz is just a genius. And so also two former Marines. So they got the handle down, the Eck handle with the, with the three screws and the divots on the side. And then this bayonet shaped blade. So gorgeous. And the action on this is incredible. And I believe this is overseas manufactured. I can't believe uh, that it isn't. And the reason I say that is because I was able to afford it somewhat. It was an expensive knife. Uh, but I feel like if this with the two men at the helm and it's integral, I forgot to show you that, my first integral knife, all of this would cost a lot more made in the United States than what I paid for. So I'm, I'm guessing it's, uh, it's foreign made. Doesn't matter. It's amazing. I love it. So this is my, this is my big daddy purchase. Uh, for the for the show last up to show you is something that Tim gave me Tim Kell um, gave me because this one is about to pop off this is this one's about to be uh, released and it's the agent 002 so you know the agent one has the the uh, double-edged fighting blade well the agent two is this really cool Warncliffe and uh, these are I know he's got all of the blades uh, back from Nickel Boron and, uh, you know, uh, back from that process. And he's ready to handle them and sharpen them. And and I know he's got sheaths in the making. So this is the second in the uh, Agent series. And he sh has prototypes going up to six here. And it's really cool. Uh, number three has kind of a Night Stalker blade drop point. Um, and then there, 
I can't remember what the other ones were, but hopefully I get to design 007. <laughs> that would be cool. Uh, but uh, here it is. Love that handle. And look forward to this. This is a great, there's going to be a great work knife, great self-defense knife because of that Warncliffe shape. All right, so this is, uh, these are the things I've acquired. I'm going back over today. I might acquire a few more, but, uh, you know, I'm not made of money, unfortunately. Oh, I, I got to show you this, too. It's a little off color, uh, but it's from Steve Kalari Customs. So, uh, Steve, if you know him, he's got a great and uh, somewhat bawdy sense of humor. And I was over there uh, talking to him. He's blowing up. Um, he's got, he's doing so well. It was great to see him and his wife. But they also have shot glasses. And I like to do a shot every now and again. And uh, we have a little shot shot glass collection at home. And this one, Steve Kalari Customs there. I don't know if you can see that. There's logo. And then you turn it around and it says balls. <laughs> so, uh, balls. I don't know, but I like it. Uh, all right, moving on. Uh, so I went through the uh, the show, the, the baller room and the big room, and uh, did some interviews. I did seven interviews, and they're pretty awesome. The first one is with Zach Wingard of Wingard Wearables, and this is their first time coming to Blade Show, and they had such a great setup. Their setup, super cool. Um, they had all the, all the drawings, all the mechanical drawings and sketchbook drawings of all of his different uh, tomahawks and stuff under glass, and then all of the products on top. And a beautiful sign, a giant empress uh, tomahawk. It was great to see him, great to talk with him. And uh, he had a lot of attention uh, at, at the Blade Show. So uh, check it out. This is Zach Wingard. All right. You are at the best table at Blade Show. I'm here with Zach Wingard of Wingard Wearables. Zach, how's it going, sir? Life is always good, but it's even better at Blade Show. So this is your very first Blade Show. How's it going? It's going great. We're high energy. It is all edgy over here. Uh, we've got lots of interest in these uh, everyday carry Comox. A lot of people hadn't heard of our brand before, so it's just been fantastic. What are you, what are you showing here this year that's new? The Sparrowhawk. So this fits blade cover under the arm, spike cover, pommel cover, and you wear this comfortably under a covering garment. You can wear this all day long. So that's new at Blade Show. Also, of course, our uh, Microfight multi-tools. These have been gone for a long time. So you've got static blade sheath cover, right? This tucks into your pants, and this is tethered to your body. So when you draw this out, the sheath comes out and stays behind because of that static line. That's over 15 inches of steel you can wear in your waistband so two and it's, a half it's inch kind of blade. like a spear like it, it is it is like a spear you can wear on your body you got two and a half inch blade good for like cuts you got hammer face and you got all kinds of thrusty goodness this thumb pad here intuitive hand-eye coordination you got two hands you can put on it for power-ups you got your core in it very difficult to deflect a thrust like that with two hands behind it that's what's new at blade show and you can twirl it. It's so tasteful, you know? <laughs> it's fun. I notice you have a couple of different sizes here, the Empress and the Back Ripper. What's that all about? All right, so this is our full size Empress and Back Ripper. This is a slim down handles, our Molly compatible handles. These are slim enough to slide through Molly Pal's loops. So you can wear it on your pack or your plate carrier. Like it's great to wear a tomahawk in your pants. Like I feel fantastic carrying this. But it's not for everybody. Some people won't wear it on their backpack or just have it as a bedside implement, and that's great too. But these are our most adaptable tomahawks for different carry conditions. They also carry well in shorts. Like, remember Tom Selleck from the 80s? He had really properly short shorts. <laughs> yeah. You know, you want the Molly tomahawks instead of these longer handled ones. When you're wearing your Selleck. Yeah, your so cut, yeah, your your banana hammock stuff. So if you look here, you can see that uh, the the pommel part is tapered. This makes it easy to slip between the molly loops here, and then the length is shorter overall. Yeah, and I mean the full size. This flat face here is handy for like light percussive impact, like. We get bugs in our house, like big, crawly, creepy spiders. Man, I've smooshed so many bugs with this thing. It's fantastic. Even swatted uh, like wasp out of the air, because this is so light. You got that white face, that's way better than a fly swatter. You don't want to use a fly swatter on like a yellow jacket. You're just taking that thing off. It's tomahawk time all the time. I couldn't agree more. Tomahawk time every time. 
Let yep. me take one quick look at, at the uh, Sparrowhawk and just tell me a little bit about this. This is over a half inch thick. It's the thickest full tang tomahawk you're going to see at Blade Show. It tapers down to under a quarter inch thick. We've got this leather wrap here to absorb the hand shock. Like instead of having rigid scales that go down, and it looks a bit like a bird, and this is sort of bird nest vibes, the aesthetics. This is very comfortable for taking up the hand shock. This throws really well as it's going through the spin rotations. You've got a high probability of sticking and a concentrated impact. And it batons really well because of that thickness. You can baton with the back of the bird head, the back of the bird neck. You can plant this on the ground and baton from the top to split up smaller pieces of wood. It's a fantastic tomahawk for bushcraft, combatives, throwing, and it looks beautiful. It does. That blade is really sharp. I was feeling it before. Yes. We've, we've had some customers tell us uh, it's sharper than what they've handled before. They've come with some bandages, so you got to be careful. Don't don't toss them uh, you know, and catch them like they are for juggling. Well, Zach, I'm going to let you get back to it. A lot of people come into your booth, and I'm just standing in the way. Hey, but, have a great blade show. Be edgy. Next up in the baller room as well, this is a company I wasn't aware of and um, had never met, but I definitely want to work with them. I want to, well, and you'll see why, uh, but uh, this is Jared of Gunfighter Knives. And Gunfighter, Knife, uh, Gunfighter Customs are, again, um, uh, Marines, uh, former Marines, at least two of them were. I, I'm not sure if the third one was a Marine or, or in the Army, but uh, uh, veterans making really cool knives. They have their own models, um, many of them based on Pikiti Tertia and other Filipino martial arts style blades. And then, and then they also just do straight up customs. You come to them with a design and uh, they'll work with you and make it. Uh, work with you on materials and design and make the knife for you. And I love that. That seems to be somewhat uh, uncommon these days uh, to have someone kind of do that. Uh, just making other people's designs custom as they come in. Um, so... Uh, check this out. This is Jared with Gunfighter Customs. Yeah. So, so we do full custom shit. I'm here with Jared Franklin of Gunfighter Customs. Hey guys, how are you, sir? I'm good. We're having a good time at the play show. Uh, I'd like to talk to y'all. Uh, if you have any questions? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, your work is new to me, but it's so in my wheelhouse. I'd love you to tell me a little bit about the company and what you're producing right here. Well, uh, when I got out of the Marines, I found myself with a lot of free time, and uh, my, my dad is a knife maker. He's uh, Mike Franklin of Hog Knives. So I had been making knives as a kid, and uh, when I joined the Marines, I stopped. I didn't have time to do it, of course. And uh, I decided to start making again, and uh, most of the guys I was making knives for were Marines. So that's how the name Gunfighter Customs came about, is I would make knives for Marines. And they would just hit me up with an idea, and I would draw it out for them and, and make it up. So show me one of your signature blades here. All right. This is, uh, this is our E-Bit. This is... Mike Elliott design. That's his logo right there on the back. So every knife you see with that on it, designed by him. She ran straight to the gun. This is uh, inspired by Filipino martial arts. So and it's a, it's a utility blade. All of them are meant to be used and used hard. So this blade comes with a lifetime warranty, lifetime sharpening. If you break it, I'll make you a new one. If it gets dull, I'll sharpen it anytime. It's really beautiful. That looks like an uh, like, uh, like, uh, uh, antique micarta handles there. Yes, this is vintage burnt orange paper micarta with uh, CPM crewwear. So pretty good combo, I think. So what, what would you say is the overriding philosophy of Gunfighter Customs in terms of the kind of knives you make? I make a knife based on what the customer wants. Uh, me, myself, I prefer a knife that you can use for self-defense, tactical, and bushcraft survival. And all of my knives are meant to be used and abused, you know, used hard. That's what I like. 
So uh, I'm, the, I'm the on the Knife Junkie podcast. Where I've interviewed so many knife makers who are former Marines. I love it. Uh, what is it about being a Marine that leads people to making knives? Well, the Marines inherently like weapons, and whenever we get some downtime or whatever, we'll be standing around. Everybody's got a knife in their pocket, so. That, that brings up a lot of conversations. A lot of Marines are big knife guys. And, you know, and it just comes with the, with the territory. All right, show me uh, that sword you've got there. It looks right, like a good hunting. Okay. This is uh, Gunfighter Customs Combat Warrior Academy Ganunti. These I make out of CPM 3V. Uh, it's got a 15 inch blade. And, uh, the top can be sharpened or dull, depending on what you want. And uh, we usually do a textured G10 on these. And uh, it's got a pretty aggressive punio here. I love the punio. Yes. You can use that. For, you can use your imagination for what you can do with that. What about the holes in the blade? These were just for lightning purposes. Okay, lightening up the blade. Right. Right. And uh, you know. Of course, like everything, this is meant to be used. Um, you know, we, we cut down trees with this, we split wood with it, and we train with it, we do everything. So. so it's an obvious weapon, but it can be used as, a, as an all-arounder tool. Uh, he's made uh, several videos that are on his YouTube channel, and the things he's done with his are just incredible, incredible. Uh, how this deal holds up is, is amazing. All right, so as we wrap here, what do, what do you want people to know about your company? What's a good way to get in touch with you? What's your What do you want people to know? Uh, well, uh, I'm real easy to work with. Uh, I'm real flexible on payment situations. And uh, basically, I want to make you happy. So whatever you want, I can build for you. Beautiful. True custom knives here. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Jared. Thank you. Of Gunfighter Customs. Your work is really beautiful. And thank you so much. Very cool. Take care. Have a good one, y'all. Strolling around in the big room, I saw a table full of beautiful kukris. Look up, and there's Jason Knight. Hey, how you doing? Jason Knight is a he's a mensch, man. He's a really cool dude. Uh, I would like to have his vibe someday. He seems to be very zen, you know, just very chill and comfortable. And anyway, uh talking to him he was telling me everything telling me about what's going on so i asked him if i could get him on camera saying it he said yeah come on back and i got to go behind the the booth and to me that's a huge honor and pleasure i, I went behind the booth in a couple of places that's really it's really cool to me uh anyway so i went back there and talked with jason knight and uh uh he he showed me uh some cool stuff and 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 told, especially this family sword you'll see um but told me that making those kukris is not as easy as he makes them look. Check it out. I'm behind the table with Jason Knight. Jason, how you doing, sir? I am well. How's your blade show going? Uh, it's going pretty good. All right, so what do you have new here? I, actually, before we get to any of that, show me the family sword you were just talking oh, about. Oh, the family sword. Yeah, I, was, I recommend every family have a family sword. This was made by me and my son and Dale and Mark Winburn. So this is based on an Anglo-Saxon blade with the Chinese gin stylized garden pommel. This is the sun, the moon, and the little sapphires and laid in gold are the stars. That blade is beautiful. Let me get close on that Damascus. It's a crazy ladder, right? That's the biggest ladder pattern I've ever done. Biggest ladder, ladder pattern class well, you've ever done? The, the longest one I've ever done. It's, it's got some nice chatoyance. Refracting light out of it. I see you have some of the kukris out. Can you uh, show us one of those? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh. Okay, let me get hurt. So, um, I'll give you a quick background. When I was a kid, me and my cousin were looking in an old barn and there was a toolbox full of knives and K bars and Mark IIs, and there was a kukri. And um, he thought it was ugly, but I, I liked it. You know, the traditional kukris to me have some, some issues. 
So as I began making knives, I started to make them with what I was like the improvement I wanted on them. You know, I wanted the handle to be different and I didn't want the blade to be so curvy. Some of them are way too curvy. So this is kind of my latest version of it, but I've been making kukris, gosh, probably since 2004 or five. And they really got popular about 2010. And uh, so far, I haven't seen anybody else can forge them and grind them like this. But so I'm just, gonna do a class on how to do it too. You were just saying that this is a really difficult knife to make, even, yeah. even for you. What's why? Just the grinds. The grinds are tricky to grind. So this is. Uh, if you look down at this way, it's it's a curve and it curves back. It's just a tricky. So when I when I make these, I grind this first, I grind that second, I grind that third. This edge is like a scandy edge; it just comes down to zero. This is more flat and convex is into sharp, and then the point is robust again. It looks like it's double edged, but it's not. I don't sharpen the back. I, I like the way this looks, and it reduces weight, it allows it to pass through things. But I don't want I don't like making these sharp. There's no real point in being sharp. Yeah, yeah. Well, these are absolutely beautiful. I love that handle. So uh, you got one new thing on the table that I that I recognize as new. Oh yeah. Tell us about that before we so wrap this here. This is um. This is on a, a bunch of EDCs. This is one that me and my son Tristan came up with. I, it's just like a quick in, small utility knife. Um, I Americanized it by putting this coffin handle on it, which is kind of fun. And then the blade shape is uh, pretty simple, pointy, sharp, robust. Uh, this is not sharp, and it just makes the point pointy. But I like having a knife I can carry every day, open boxes, open packages, whatever. Yeah, I was just uh, holding that, and it fits in all grips yeah. equally and perfectly. Super handy, yeah. And it, I like it to fit in your hand like this. You don't need a guard if you fit it like that. You can't get cut if you hold it in your hand like this. Yeah, butt it into your palm like that. All right, Jason, so what do you have coming up? Oh, coming up, we are working on a new folder design that'll be uh, hopefully made here. I'm gonna see how that's gonna go. Sometimes that's tricky. Uh, we're working on a new hunter slash utility knife that'll be, we're gonna do about a 500 piece run of them. They'll be available through dealers and uh, <laughs> the Hummingbird XL, which will be released on Kickstarter, probably around November, um, maybe sooner. But it's if you saw the, the little Hummingbird, it's slightly bigger, so we'll be doing that soon. So a robust combination of your own handmade Ford stuff and awesome stuff being manufactured elsewhere. Yeah, under your, under your uh, shingle. Yeah, I will say something funny. I'll, I'll meet new makers sometimes. Usually a folder maker, and they go, "Oh, I don't make knives like you," and I'm like. No kidding. You know, no kidding. I don't know why. Boulder makers always think they're, they're, I mean, I make boulders too, but I don't, I don't mass reduce them myself. I have somebody else to it. But we make knives by forging, by grinding, by CNC, by other people grinding. Also do classes. We teach people from all over the world. I've had people from Taiwan, Alaska, Switzerland, and even Tennessee come to my shop. All right, Jason, thanks for talking to me, man. I yeah, appreciate man. it. All right. So long. In the state of the collection, you saw the two bald man knife and tool knives, the Thicker Tross and the Thicker Clipper Tonto. Uh, well, while I was over at Bald Man Knife and Tool speaking with Brent, I pulled out the camera and asked him if we could uh, find out what's been going on with them lately. Because last time I spoke with Brent, he had uh, two models, I think, and he was just kind of gearing up. Well, he's blowing up now, and it was exciting to see. Here's Brent Smith of Bald Man Knife and Tool. All right, I'm here with Brent from Bald Man Knife Yo, and Tool. Yo, what's going on? Brent, how you doing? I'm doing great, Bob. How you doing? Good, good show? It's a great show, great you're, year. You're in a great spot this year, yeah, great, great up front. So um, since you and I spoke last, you've been up to a lot. Show us what yeah. you brought here this year. So we'll start over on this end over here with the little guys. These are my cicada knives. It's a little fifth pocket knife, uh, very kept part in design, uh, just shrunk down five inches overall, two and a half inch blade, two and a half handle, 
sheaths so you can drop it right in your pocket or your bag or your purse. We'll move over here. I have the mini albatross. We've got some saber ground, full flat ground. These are all 330 seconds, Scott. So there's, there you go. there's the saber and there's the full flat. So we've got 330 seconds stock. Um, super comfortable in hand. You can still get a full hand grip. Two and a half inch blade. So it's a real usable blade. And then we'll move over to the thick stuff, right? Yeah, let's see. So we got the thick stuff, guys. Let's come on down here. We have the thickatross, right? Or the same profile as the mini albatross. But we bump it up to a quarter inch thick oh, wow. stock. That's huge. So it's really beefy. And if they, again, they feel great in hand there uh, with that extra heft on them. Got a few models of that. And then the thicker clipper line. We've got some drop points and we have some tantos. Now these thicker clippers were your kind of inaugural knives. Right? Yeah, the thicker clipper was really like kind of a flagship knife for me. Um, and I offered the two different versions, traditional drop point and an aggressive tanto because who doesn't love a tanto with a sweet, thin, hollow grind on the main and a big, fat, blunt tip. Oh, let's, wait, let's see that. That's one of these here. So these are the tantos here. You can see it does have a thin, hollow grind there on that main bevel with a flat tip on there. I love that chisel tip. Yeah. That's really taking the American tanto to its max. It's a great, I love these knives. I love all these knives. So uh, how, how has your process changed since we were talking last? It seems like you really upped your game. Yeah, so a few things. On all the thicker series, I now machine those bevels in-house. So those thicker knives, the thicker truss, the thicker clippers, we machine all those in-house so that gives a clean bevel. We machine those pre-heat treat. So once we go into heat treat, some of these knives, you can see the heat treat patterns on them. We're able to leave that, that flame finish is what I call that. So it turns out really cool. And all these processes, just over time, we just improve, make minor little improvements over time, so everybody enjoys these knives just a little bit more. So how's the experience here been, uh, as opposed to other years? Man, this year is a great year in general. Blade Show is proving to be no exception to that rule, and it's just been great. Seeing everybody, meeting everybody, and getting to talk to all the other knife nerds like us, it's just killer. So uh, what can we expect from Bald Man Knife and Tool in, in the next coming year? Man, I've got a few other things I'm working on with Bald Man Knife and Tool. Again, I'm going to keep cranking these knives out that everybody loves. And I'm continually trying to find time to add more models that fit in this design language. Awesome. Well, Brent, it was awesome to see you. And, Bob. Uh, congratulations on your success here. you got some really beautiful stuff and you're rolling. Thank you. It's great talking. My pleasure. Also blowing up is Steve Kalari of Steve Kalari Custom Knives. You know, you maybe remember him uh, as Super Steel Steve back in the day, uh, but he has fully transitioned into a full-time knife maker and he is killing it. He's got distributors and he's got a lot of loyal customers, uh, yours truly included. As a matter of fact, I have a knife he just finished uh, that he did not bring with him to Blade. He spaced it and he was overly apologetic. Uh, I told him, send it to me in the mail. It's better than traveling with it and worrying whether TSA likes kitchen knives. Uh, so he'll be sending that to me. Uh, check it out. This is uh, Steve Kalari of Steve Kalari Custom Knives telling us what's going on with him. He had a great spot this year. Went from the baller room to the very front of the big room. And, uh, well, check him out. I'm here with Steve Kalari from Steve Kalari Custom Knives. Steve, how's it going, sir? It's going great, man. It's good to see you. So this is good to see you too. This is your second year showing Steve Kalari Custom Knives at Blade Show, and you're in a fantastic spot in the I'm big awesome room. Spot. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in the big room. Yeah, I'm a, I want to be a real knife maker. Like, I'm in the big room now. We're, what, one, two, three rows from almost the main, yeah, the main entrance. So it's wild. It's, 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 yeah, it's a lot of people. So show us what you've been up to since last we spoke. So what I got left over here is obviously yes. still got kitchen knives over here. This is a seven inch uh, Bunka, probably my most popular uh, kitchen knife. And then I believe, yeah, I've got a six inch chef right here is about the second most popular. Um, I flex it a little this year. Uh, this is an actual traditional Yanagiba a sushi knife. So it's uh, this is chef cut high carbon steel, 65 Rockwell. It's got a custom Mamone on it. So it's uh, saber ground on one side, it has a triple hollow grind. 
on the back. So it's a very complicated grind to pull off. And then we got some like 3,500 year old bog oak bolster, brass liners, mo uh, vintage mosaic pins, and in burl handle. That is gorgeous. Wait, you just said a triple hollow grind. What yeah. in the hell is a triple hollow grind? So th there's a triple hollow grind on these traditionally. What it is is it's done with two small wheels and then a larger wheel. So the top and the bottom here are a three inch hollow grind, and then it all gets kind of blended with a big eight inch hollow grind. So I decided to make my life even more complicated than to just grab an 8-inch wheel because, you know, I'm channeling the Japanese masters. So we know that you're a chef by training and, and a former career, and we also uh, know that you started with chef's knives here, but I see that you've expanded your line. What, what are you doing now? So now we got EDC knives. So I had a lot of guys ask me for EDC knives because everybody knows I'm about performance, performance grind, performance heat treat, so now I'm into EDC knives. Uh, I've been selling a ton of them. I throw them up, I usually do everything through Blade Binge. You guys are looking for a drop, I put them up on Blade Binge and they're gone within a couple minutes. I've got a couple, I've got four different blade shapes, a uh, traditional drop point, a worn cliff. So we've got, let's see, right here is a traditional drop point. Then we've got my worn cliff. Down here we've got kind of a sheep's foot guy. And then I have one other over here, here uh, which I don't know if that ram's foot, worn foot, something foot. <laughs> So, yeah, all of these are 130,000 stock. These are in CPM Crewwear at 65 Rockwell. Those are CPM Magna Cut at 64 Rockwell. All of them are under 5,000 behind the edge because we care. So super thin. Yes. So these are knives that cut? These are knives that cut. Oh. This, is, this is what we do. How do you pry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no pry, yeah. These, we make knives that cut, cut for a long time. So speaking of pry, my prying eyes see that. Is that a new blade shape? So this, here we go, this is gonna be fun. So this is actually a collaboration between me and Neve's knives. So this is a fixed blade that, we're, that I did. I, he didn't even know I brought it here, I just showed him the other day. So this is, this is the prototype, so there might be a little bit different, but this is Jared's design. Uh, it's kind of this double poom, warny thing going on. It kind of, if you look at his new folder, it kind of has a similar, it's kind of his design style. We've got, uh, uh, carbon fiber, bolster, uh, Tiffany uh, liners and the uh, divider, and then a cross-cut natural micarta uh, scale with Tiffany pins. This one right here is in uh, Magna Cut at 64 Rockwell. We're still playing around with it. Whether we're, I, I want to show up the Chai Coms and I want to do it in K390 and run it at like 68. Uh, I think Jared wants to do the same. It'll either be Magna Cut or K3. We're going to play around with it. Or maybe 10B. We'll see. I'm pushing for that because I want to show them up with their lackluster K390. <laughs> I love we, you, Jared. We can, all, we can always count on Steve to uh, take it to the chat. I'm going to take yeah. <laughs> and again, these are all going to be ground super thin, 5 thou after the edge is put on them, so they're going to cut for days. Uh, the stock thickness on these is only about 100 thou. So these are going to be laser beams. Yeah. So do these EDC knives come with cheese? Yes, sir. These all come with... I, I have these sheets right here. I got them in three different colors. These are uh, handmade in Kentucky. And I'm working on, I got a buddy. Uh, his name's uh, Keanu. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll shout out his name. I can't remember what his name is on Instagram, but he's a custom uh, sheet maker. And I'm trying to get him to make the sheets for this. So Keanu, make my sheets. But yeah, these are USA made. Uh, they come with drop leather sheets. So you've done a lot and uh, over this past year and you're doing that, but what else is coming up for Steve Kalari? After I get done with this, I gotta go home and start working on this. So I did the Huck, which was uh, the collaboration with Blade Binge and the guys over there, Eric, and we're gonna do a version two. Um, and that, I've got the prototypes of that uh, coming soon. I'm actually working with uh, Chris Reed Knives. Uh, Tim's a good friend of mine, and he's helping do some of the uh, the water jetting and the whole drilling. So everything's gonna, going forward, everything's gonna be really, uh, like really precise. So those are all getting water jetted through uh, laser cut through Niagara, and he's gonna be doing the milling work and the hole drilling on them, so they're all gonna be just tatas. Those are gonna be, I believe, in Magna Cut, uh, 64, 5,000, the whole lot, and those are gonna be with, if everything goes right, uh, camo carbon fiber, teal, and black, it's like they call it Britney Blue uh, scales. So those are gonna be a blade binge, and I'm, it's, last run we did, I think, 20, 25, and they sold out in like 10 minutes, so this, we're gonna, I'm gonna make a, hopefully a bunch more, uh, and so we'll have some for, for everybody. So that's coming up and uh, 
try to remember I, I, something else. I'm forgetting. I'm on two hours of sleep. But well, maybe yeah. we have another interview. We can yeah, yeah, we'll do another. Yeah, but that's that's on the, on the definite horizon. So oh. filling my vendors back up with chef knives and then working on that blade binge uh, project is the next up. So Steve, it's such a pleasure seeing things take off for you, man, and your work. It speaks for itself. It's awesome. As I mentioned before, I started rolling. Uh, your two knives that we have are the only ones that get used, and we got another one coming, so I'm psyched. Making make memories and families' houses. That's right. A little bit of Steve man. in your house. Good to see you. <laughs> Next up, Tim Kell of T. Kell Knives. Um, you know, I've been talking about him quite a bit because of the Agent 001. I had to go over and get uh, uh, get his take. Now, I went behind his table as well, and it was not as good for shooting. You might You might see and next year, my camera girl will be my older daughter. She was going to come this year, but had too much too much partying to do at the beginning of June. So next year, she'll come, and uh, the video will be stepped up a notch. Uh, but here is Tim uh, telling us all about not just the Agent series, but everything else. You'll see all these great prototypes. Here's Tim, uh, Tim Kell with T-Kell Knives. I'm here with the great and powerful Tim Kell, T-Kell Knives. Wait, Tim? Look at, this. Look at that setup you've got here. That's my name up there. <laughs> That's crazy, right? So, besides the agent, well, you tell me, what's new this year? What's going on? How's your show going? The biggest news is the agent has been going insane. We'll show it because we have to. So we dropped these yesterday at noon, and we have about 30 left, which is insane. So this is the double-edged version. And this is the single edge. And this will be a good teaching moment. So you see we left more stock here on the reverse and forward edges so that we could thicken that tip up where we wanted to be able to cut deep here. So we've got thinner here and here and thicker here and thicker here. And that's what we did on those single edge, double edge, ADCLV, AEBL. Now you know. So they're going to be in two steels, two different grinds, and we're selling the shit out of them. I mean, that is awesome. This is our biggest single blade launch in history. What was that? The biggest single blade launch in history, the ages. And we did them with one guy, the camera guy, Bob DeMarco <laughs> of the Ninth Junkie Podcast. Well, I'm, uh, I'm flattered and thrilled about that, but what else you got? I've seen some really cool stuff on so the So here's the second one we're going to do on the Agent yeah. series. That's Agent 002. And that'll be out. I was going to wait until we sold out of Agent 1, but that's going to happen tomorrow. So we'll probably drop these early so we can get started back on Agent 1. And then this will be 3, 4, 5. I don't know who's going to get double or single. Oh boy, I think that should be you. Uh, or me. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's the two, the three, and then these are uh, resin, res resin prints of the four and the five. That Tonto is wicked. Wicked. You got something else on the table that is super exciting. Which folder? Which one? Uh, this guy? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about the folder. This one? Yeah. <laughs> Where's the peanut butter folder? I, it's, I brought it over to it's the other It's gone. Side. All right, look. So this is the folder. This is our first attempt, and it has its roots here. So this is the M2, which is the mini mercenary. So I love this grip platform. I've got to make it combat style because that's what I do. But it's roller bearing, black titanium, VG10, ambidextrous, so you can switch the clip around. And these will be done very soon. You got the grenade grips. There. Right. So this is the first on our CW platform, which is Camera Wife, who is now world famous. You guys saw her a minute ago. She was a little bit embarrassed. There's Camera <laughs> Wife. She's going to kill us. I'm always I love it. I mean, it's just. So this is called the M, what do you call it? M2. M2. Mini Mercenary. Mer okay. The M squared. Here's the peanut butter. See that person? This, this is really exciting because not everyone is into carrying a fixed blade. Really great action on that. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it is, what, three years? Yeah, yeah. I've been, last year that blade, you would do this, and it wouldn't open, you'd have to push the button to get it open. Now we defeated the lock. So are you making these? No, okay. we're outsourcing most of this. Okay. What we're trying to do is get the internals right, and then we're gonna pull it 
back in house. So we're going to fund the ability to build a factory to make these out of this project. So it's called Mission EDC. It's our mission. Makes sense? It does indeed. Well, uh, what else you got in the offing here, Tim? I see I a think bunch of cool stuff. This one is going to be next. We're taking boats. So this is the DP1, and that's named after Camera White's dad, Donald Pace 1. So I made this knife for him 10 years ago, and he told me this is the favorite blade that you've ever made of mine. And I just never finished it. We, everything else took off, and this is an homage to him, but everybody has picked this up at Blade Show. So we're doing that. We just started. Before you move on to that next one, I just got to say my impression of this is it's got it's got the standard thickness of one of your knives, but it's two fingers, and that standard standard thickness makes this a real good in the hand tiny knife. That was coming. We just got the steel, and you are a fan of the combatant. So yes. this is the combatant, and like I always do, I expanded the line, and this is the warning that's coming. So we just got the steel from New Jersey last week. So we're going to start cutting these next week. So it's got a little drop. I don't know if you can see. A little bit of a, a thumb drop. A nasty little worn clip. Super high ground. I'm, I'm really excited about that one. Most people are, are going crazy. I was going to do the Tonto, but nobody really cared. So we decided we're going to... say no one loves Nobody cared. Nobody loves him. I like it. So I, I hear you. The clip is cooler. We're going to push the DP1 further ahead of schedule for that. This one's pretty rad. So this is our skeleton skinner. It'll come with out, but you'll get the scales in the box. This has been a whole lot of work. So it's super thin. So it'll be 90. Super thin. We're going to do first run in 3V. So I'm very excited about that one too. So you'll be able to run it ultra lightweight. Maybe the skeleton raider because it's a raider blade. That one's coming. So uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Here it is. So, finally the hatchet. And we need feedback on this one. It is stipulated to be under an eight and a half by 11 size piece of paper. We can't really divulge whom is inspiring and commissioning this design, but there are three letters and they wanted it to be able to fit inside of a folder. That's awesome. It's like a trapper keeper was the word they used. So they dated themselves <laughs> with that. But this is, we started resin printing everything because I irritate my machinist by making a tiny little tweak up here. And we've made it in steel. So now they bought me a resin printer and said, you're a deep. So right now it's 187. So 316, but we may grow it maybe 200. Grenade texture. I love Outstanding. It. I can't wait. I love Tim, it. thank you so much, man. Absolutely, man. Not, not only for talking to me here, but also for believing in the agent and going it's for it. Beautiful. I'm so psyched about it. Me too, man. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, man. Last up is a longer interview, uh, but you'll know why when you see who it is. It was with Lynn Thompson of, you know, Lynn Thompson. Uh, I, had a, I had the pleasure of having breakfast with him and his associate Richard at our hotel. You know, we, we were at the same hotel and uh, he was getting breakfast at the same time. I just walked by him, said, good morning, Lynn. You know, I wasn't, you know, not trying to, not trying to uh, horn it, hone in on anyone's, you know, quiet breakfast time. He came down and sat with me and we, we had an hour and a half long breakfast just talking and it was great. You know, I eventually I had to peel away because I was worried about not, you know, I had other interviews to do. And uh, so he said, well, let's talk later. Um, so I met up with him over at the Demco booth and we sat down on the couch and talked knives and other stuff. And he's going to be coming back on the show. Cannot wait. We're going to talk about American manufacturing, but a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, here for your listening enjoyment, Lynn Thompson. I'm here with the great and powerful Lynn Thompson here at Blade Show. Lynn, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to me. It's my honor to be here. I'm really enjoying the show. So you've been coming to Blade Show for years and years and years. How have you seen it change from your perspective, from a knife maker's perspective? Well, I came to the first show, I believe it was 1983 or 84. I think it was in 
in uh, Missouri or Kansas. And that's where I met Master Smith Dan Maragni. So that relationship with him that endured for so many years and, and benefited me so much was directly responsible because I went to the Blade Show. So I'm grateful to the Blade Show for the opportunity to come and meet um, really talented knife makers and see all kinds of cool stuff. Um, if you love knives, this is the mecca of the knife world. No kidding, no kidding. Now, it wasn't always like that. You know, it went through, I would say, a slump in the 80s. It, some years we came and some years we didn't come. But about seven or eight years ago, I metamorphosed into a real, a real must-attend show. And they persevered for a number of years, and I have to give them credit. you got to give credit where credit is due. They had this business, and I think it struggled for a while, and they, they, they kept at it, kept at it. Now it's a huge success, and you know, you got to struggle. Now you struggle to get into it. Right. So congratulations to the Blade Show. Well, so I'm walking around here. It's it's really uh, it's almost stressful because I want to see everything and talk to everyone, and there's no way to do that in one weekend. Uh, what are you seeing here? Like, are you seeing any trends, anything prevailing that you're noticing uh, that's interesting to you? I brought idea a few of my ideas that, that there was a few of them there. I've identified some trends that I, I think could go, but I'm not really willing to name them here. And, help all my competitors <laughs> yeah I've been uh, I, I'm doing a lot of studying here and I do a lot of preparation before I come and I know what I'm looking for but I think the quality of work is really good I love the fact that so many more people are open about making martial knives in the 80s you know I was an outcast because of my interest in martial knives and even into the 90s and now everyone's doing it it's fully accepted and I'll take some credit for that because I feel like I was the icebreaker, the ship that went ahead and broke a lot of ice to get martial and tactical stuff accepted. Yeah, like uh, the Tonto, the American Tonto, your Tonto uh, did a lot for that and then everything after that. Well, it's the first commercial knife that sold for more than $130 ever. So right. every, every commercial maker in here that's selling a knife for over $100, they should write me a check. I, I saved up in 1988 when I was in high school to get that Tonto. And yeah, I remember 130 bucks or so. I was like, wow, I can't believe I'm paying this money. And I, I still my bedside knife. Awesome. Well, I spent a lot of time explaining why it's worth it. Yeah. You know, why, why, what makes this knife worth $130? Well, I had a whole list of reasons why I think it's worth it. So everyone knows about uh, Cold Steel's uh, sale to GSM, you know, a few years back, and we see the videos. We know that you're still involved with Cold Steel, but are you designing knives and still pressing forward with your own personal projects? I am. I tried to get Cold Steel to adopt some of the stuff with, I would say, very modest success. And you know, when you sell a company and you get paid. They can do whatever they want with that company, yes. and they are. And I try to influ keep influence them in the direction that I would want to go, but I can't force anybody to do anything. But so I, I'm still designing things. I'm still making things. I'm still researching. I'm doing a lot of training. Uh, lately, I've been walking two hours a day, besides my regular training, uh, trying to get in better shape and to get even faster. So to that point, you're um, a lifelong martial artist, but in many, many different arts. Um, with the skill and abilities you've accrued over those years, you might, one could say you probably have your own style at this point, but um, what, I know a lot of men watch this show, and you know, men of a certain age, certainly, I'm 52, and a lot of my peers watch this show. What kind of advice would you give men, especially as they approach middle age, in terms of staying staying a force to reckon with as they as they grow older never stop training even if you so i used to train sometimes three hours a day now i train two hours a day or two and a half hours a day i used to take no days off except sunday now i i go shooting on wednesdays so i used to take wednesdays i only walk and sundays i take off entirely and but i would say that as you get older, you have to work harder or you'll lose it. The body renews itself. I read a lot of books on aging 
And one of them was how to be 80 when you're 50. And they maintain that you have to work out two hours hard every day. And if you do that, your body will keep renewing itself and stay young until your natural clock runs out. So a lot of people, when they hit 40, they started going on this decline. I don't know see if my hand motion. They go on this decline like this physically until they crash out. If you work out hard all the time and you eat right and you get enough sleep, you'll find that your decline goes much, much slower. And you can be in pretty darn good, formidable shape into your mid 80s. And like my, my teacher, Guru Dan Anasanto, is 87. I wouldn't want to fight him, not in a million years. And he's 87 years old. Uh, I'm not fighting him. So, you know, maybe his, he lives pretty long in his family. You know, his his lifespan might be 100. You know, I'm praying God to give me 105 good years. My great grandmother on my dad's side died at 106 and she had all our marbles. My grandmother on my dad's side lived to be 99. His his brother died at 100, his sister at 101. So we live a long time on both sides of the family. So if I don't get killed, there's a good chance I'll get killed because I do adventuresome stuff and I take risks. Yep. So I'm prepared for that. But failing that, I think I'll, I'll probably kick along into my late 90s. Or, well, there's an old saying that uh, if you give up all the stuff that makes you want to live to 100, you won't live to 100. So you, can, you can't right. stop hunting. Or doing no, any of that stuff. it's like my wife says, I know you're tired. Why are you going into the gym? And I said, I got to back up my bullshit. <laughs> In other words, yes, you, know, you guys that know me, you know that I, I, one of my failings is I'm not humble, but I don't have a stingy bone on my back. I give you the shirt off my back, but I don't. I don't always think about it bragging because I can do what I say I can do. And I'm constantly striving to maintain that and to exceed it. So this this pops into But mind. it's work. Oh yeah. You know, I find I need nine hours sleep now to recover. I get a massage every week. So I put some effort into my my recovery. That's funny you say that. I used to be able to live on four and a half hours of sleep every night for years and years and now I'm starting to it's not like that anymore. If I could give another piece of advice is it, it get a minimum of eight hours. If you're going to train hard, you need eight, nine hours sleep. Now, the NBA did a big study about their athletes. And when they had their professional basketball players go from eight hours sleep to 10 and 12 hours of sleep, they saw a 30% increase in performance, 30%. That's they tracked them, how many more rebounds they caught, how many more baskets they shot all of that stuff and their performance went up exponentially by the amount of sleep they got. They also gave them all CPAPs. So you're getting 100% oxygenation of your blood all night long. So even though if you don't have sleep apnea and you want to be a really good athlete, get it anyways because it's going to force air through your nose all night long and you're going to get super oxygenated blood and that's going to help your recovery a lot. Almost every professional athlete uses one. And I know they're making them smaller now. They're not as... Uh... Well, wait, getting back to the knives real quick. I, this is something I wanted to ask you when I had you on the show. And by the way, people, uh, Lynn will be coming back on the show. We're excited about that. Uh, I am too. I love the show. Thank you. Uh, but, but a question I have is um, you've done, with Cold Steel, you did so many amazing designs based on historical examples, some from your collection, some that you admire. Uh, what knife before you hang up your spurs that you haven't made from history, would you like to embark on? I'll probably make a Yadagon. The Yadagon, wasn't that uh, sort of an influence for the... Uh, Vaquero. Vaquero. So, so I read Sir Burton Richardson's Book of the Sword a long time ago, and they said the Yadagon was the perfect cut and thrust weapon. The curves accentuated cutting but lined up for the thrust, so it was the best compromise. And so I use that idea to design my Vaquero blades. So this is directly influenced by the Turkish Yadagon. Love that. You know, I always assumed it was because we first saw the Vaquero on the El Hombre and the and the um, and the Vaquero Grande back in the 90s. I always assumed it was based on the Navaja, um, but it, it never quite looked like a Navaja to me. So uh, it's really cool to know that it's a Yadagon, and, and uh, I gotta say, I really hope you do make one because your swords are great and your knives are great. So I think uh, that's the perfect combination right there. So you're gonna see other 
Far Eastern influences in some of my designs that I've admired for a long time. Um, that was my interest in the Chris. You know, I, I studied the switch blades. I saw a lot of flame blade or Chris blade uh, switch blades, and I wanted to make one to go in a tie light. And I think it's been pretty successful. Yeah, that's one of the my. The one is badass. I mean, it's that's a scary knife. That is a scary knife. Uh, so. And suddenly it, it slips my mind. Uh, having to do with the... Well, anyway, the uh, all of your short swords I'm in love with. I love all of the uh, Filipino stuff and the influences you have. Before we wrap here, do you have your engraved XL? Uh, yeah. Yeah, check this out, guys. Tell me to rock it if I need to so you get the... Yeah, that is something else. Uh, can you flip it around? That's the side I remember with all the uh, cowboy sort of flirtily stuff. Gorgeous, gorgeous knife. Is this the one you have on you? Well, all right, before we go, actually, I got to do a pocket check. What Everything you have on you. That's almost everything. They don't show all my knives. You, you, yeah, this is. These are the ones for public consumption. Look yeah, at that, guys. That many. Look at that. That's amazing. I love it. Two two vaqueros. I encourage everybody to get one of these broken skulls. You can still find them. They weigh about three ounces, and they got a lock that holds over 200 pounds. They go in your shirt pocket like this, and you forget about them. Yeah, I used to carry one in my waistband every so day. So handy, and no weight, and. It's great for all kinds of utility stuff. What I love about it is I can cut apples. If I'm around kids, I'm always cutting apples up for them. And, but it all, in a pinch, it also works as a great self-defense knife. It'll work that way too. And it's really sharp. Yeah. Yeah. So they're pretty easy to, I use a Spyderco sharp maker all the time on this yeah very easy to sharpen it keep it sharp well then i want to thank you so much for this brief interview we'll do another one coming up anytime soon. be my pleasure awesome thank you so much you bet all right have a great show thanks well that does it for the blade show 2024 edition of the knife junkie podcast i hope you enjoyed uh, uh hearing from zach jared jason brent steve tim and lynn uh, it was certainly a pleasure for me uh, to talk to them, and uh, it's one of the best parts about Blade Show. Yes, the blades are cool. Yes, the blades are sweet. But really, uh, I was look, I was running around not looking for knives, running around looking for people all day because uh, they're the great ones who make this awesome community. So, um, if you ever have the uh, the druthers uh, and the means, I highly recommend a uh, a trip, a pilgrimage to Atlanta. Uh, to check out this fantastic show. I bet Texas and Blade Show West are equally cool. I got to check those out myself and make that journey. So, well, that's it for this uh, this edition. Be sure to join us on Sunday when we talk to uh, uh, Dawson Knives. Dawson Knives making incredible stuff. John Roy, one of the, one of the three uh, main figureheads there. So uh, be sure to check that out. For Jim, working as magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.